Bueno. Buenas noches. Bueno, buenas noches. Este, muchas gracias a todos y todas por estar aquí. Esta, eh, pues queremos darles la, la bienvenida de parte de todo el Festival Litan Luz de esta actividad que se llama Cómo las cosas hacen cosas con otras cosas y personas. Eh, cuatro distinguidos escultores y artistas de Chicago hablando sobre la agencia de la eh, materia. Yo soy Esteban King y voy a estar aquí moderando esta mesa el día de hoy. Soy colaborador del festival. Y bueno, pues este, eh, este año el Festival Litan Luz pasa tanto virtual como de manera física. Nos da eh, mucho gusto estar de vuelta para las actividades presenciales y virtuales. Y en su octavo ciclo, el festival eh, Litan Luz, organizado por Make Literary Productions, eh, pues está apoyando la creación de nuevas colaboraciones a partir de diálogos entre México y Estados Unidos. Este año el festival trata sobre la estructura y considera tanto las estructuras físicas como las estructuras políticas y sociales en las que vivimos y que nos rodean. So, well, thank you everyone for being here. Uh, we are be very glad to have you all. Uh, tonight, I'm, I'm introducing uh, this uh, incredible uh, panel we're going to have with four sculpt sculptors from Chicago. Uh, this is How Things Do Things with Other Things and People. Four sculptors discusses the agency of matter. Uh, I'm Esteban King. I'm going to be moderating this panel. I'm a collaborator of the festival Lit and Loose. And well, we are uh, this year's Lit and Loose Festival features both in person events and in Chicago virtual events such as this one. And we are grateful to be back in person and also be able to connect online with audiences throughout the US and Mexico and beyond. Uh, this year, this, the, the theme of the festival is a structure and we're going to have a lot of collaborations, talks, workshops, panels. So we are super happy to be in person again. Uh, and well, I'm just going to introduce a little bit of, of the participants on the panel and then I'm going to give uh, uh, the microphone to Georgina so she can introduce like the whole idea of this panel. We, uh, we are here. Um, yeah, I don't want to take too much time, so I'm just going to say a few words of each of our participants of today. Uh, where here it is, uh, Sebastián Bruno Harris. He's an artist working with assemblages of everyday objects, photos, and moving images. Uh, he was born in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and raised between Buenos Aires, Argentina, and South Florida. Uh, he studied at the Florida Atlantic University, earning his BFA in sculpture in 2016, and is currently pursuing an MFA at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. We also have today the presence of Alberto Aguilar, who is a Chicago-based artist who uses whatever materials are at hand as a way to connect with the viewer. Uh, he's going to have soon, indeed, uh, a, a solo show, I think, at the National Museum of Mexican Art in this area, as well as another group uh, exhibitions at the Franklin, uh, as well as uh, in the Lawrence Art Center. Welcome you both, guys. And we have also um, the presence here of Paola Cabal. Welcome, Paola. Uh, Born in Bogotá, Colombia, Paola Cabal has lived in Chicago since 2001. A site-specific installation artist, Cabal is best known for her rigorous observational studies of daylight over time. Movement, movements the artist photographs on site, then paints directly into spaces uh, trompe l'oeil style using spray, uh, spray paint. And as an artist and educator, Cabal is interested in the intersection between physics and the perception and she co-teaches a course called Articulating Time and Space. Welcome. And we have also uh, the, 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 the person behind all this panel, uh, el, artifice, el artifice de todo esto, uh, Georgina Valverde. Uh, Georgina Valverde is a Mexican-born multimedia artist and educator whose work encompasses sculpture, performance, writing, and critical pedagogy. 
In her sculptural work, Valverde incorporates craft and a wide range of everyday materials to create structures that invite viewers to re-examine the familiar and explore our relationship to material culture. So, well, welcome you all to uh, to this uh, panel. There's going to be like some presentation and even performances by each of the uh, participant artists. But to begin with, uh, I want uh, Georgina to, to begin with an introduction of the whole panel and about his work too. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for that great introduction, Esteban. He just landed from Mexico City yesterday, right? So, wow. Um, um, I'm so happy to see all of you here for this um, speculative conversation. Before we get started, I want to um, give a shout out to the Chicago Art Department and to Carlos Flores, who is sitting on the second row. <laughs> Carlos, thank you. Elgin Smith, Elgin Smith, who is doing marvels with technology on that side. And uh, why not Doug Lawson, who is sporting great hair in the back? who is also part of Chicago Art Department. I have a relationship with this place. It's um, a space that provides resources and space for socially minded artists to grow and question the city we live in. And it accomplishes this mission by providing artists with equitable and accessible opportunities for artistic development through studio residency. So the space, in addition to these wonderful exhibition spaces, also houses residencies. So we invite you to um, take a look at the show. Afterwards, Arte, Cultura y Resistencia, which is a show, show showcasing um, Pilsen artists that have been working in the community for decades, and um, especially in, involved in the punk aesthetics of the 1990s. So having said that, um, let's dive into how things do things with other things and people. And um, that's a title that Esteban and I kind of agreed on as a way to offset maybe the uh, very abstractness of the topic tonight, which is centered on new materialisms and ideas about the, the agency of matter, which is for me, you know, I, I wrote a chapter for a linguistics book a few years ago, and it was very difficult to wrap my brain around the idea that matter has agency. And I've come to understand that it's a push in the, not just the humanities, but across many different fields to move to a post-human position where we can decenter our you know, our hubris as humans, as um, uh, humans that think themselves at the center of the universe when in fact we are not, science tells us that, we are but specks of dust, if that much. Um, and in this way, you know, we might be able to have different conversations about especially ecology, the ecologies that we all participate in that comprise not just human beings, of course, or economic forces, but matter, other beings, um, everything that we're, we're entangled in. So rather than having taxonomies and boxes, it's uh, a way to move towards seeing ourselves as being implicated in uh, or entangled with matter and other beings. Um, so I think that that was my impetus in putting together this program to talk about the idea of structure from the, to, to, to make humans recede and make matter come to the forefront and think about what is the agency of matter in structuring, you know, more broadly our lives, our ideologies, but in the context of art and art making, how our works and ideas structured through matter. And um, I think it was Sarah that uh, thought, well, we need to have sculptors because clearly sculptors are especially involved with the idea of structure, how things fit together. So 
we're going to try to talk about that, but from the kind of back end, as humans in the background and matter in the foreground, we're going to attempt that. And we will do that by um, starting with some presentations and putting some visuals and ideas and, and, and performance in front of you. And then, um, and then we'll jump into the, to a conversation that I hope we're all going to be part of that assemblage that um, we will create together. So, Alberto Aguilar is going to set us off. And do I just press the tab? So, in the spirit of things, doing things with other things and people, Alberto is going to. Um, do a performance that will say many more things than word can words can explain. Uh, we just want you to make sure you watch your body parts um, and uh, your head, your glasses, things like that, because there's a ball that's going to be involved in this process. Hi. I 
just really want to. I, I just really want to know. I, I. Need some water. <laughs> yes, that would be great. <laughs> Can we hook up, hook up uh, Alberto with some water? <clears throat> Thanks, Dud. And are these presentations <coughs> not being a keynote person? Uh, is it? Ah, oh, what would I do without Matt? Thank you. <laughs> Keynote. I'm getting old. There's just too many moving parts of things and digital things and things that don't, whose parts don't seem so obvious to me. Um, I'm going to read my presentation so I can stay on point. And I start out with a quote by Jane Bennett's um, Vibrant Matter and the Force of Things. Protean flow is something that comes up in her writing a lot. Thing power, materialism, figures materiality as a protean flow of matter energy and figures the thing as a relatively composed form of that flow. That's a lot of words, and I'm seeing in that flow, things come to mean, things come into form, and I'm seeing my work as a process of time, uh, an entanglement with matter and uh, materials. A short bio of my entanglement with matter starts with my father, who has spent his life restoring vintage cars, and now spends his time in a small studio making miniature models of those cars that he can still work on almost at, at 90, but um, Following his doctor's advice, he's staying out of the sun, of the hot Texas sun, so he's making his models in the inside the house. And my father uses everything that's around 
that he can pick up at yard sales, uh, flea markets especially. His main material is PVC pipe that he dangerously melts or softens in the oven. Um, modified brass fittings, toothpicks, cocktail shakers, old clothing, ornate picture frames, you name it. It's all in these models that chart the history of the automobile and his own life, I suppose. Visual culture in the form of Victorian, um, I guess, handiwork comes from my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, who initiated me in the art of crochet, which is a thread that runs through my work. Her home in Mexico City was mid-century modern, but her sensibility was definitely Victorian. She was brought up to decorate, and she made endless, endless, you know, lace trimmings for pillows and towels and anything that would allow it. The magical and uncanny visuality of Mexico, the thing power at work in the living Mesoamerican cultures, which tends to be in harmony with the environment as opposed to the destructive relationship that we tend to have in the so-called industrial and post-industrial world, and how it lives in diaspora in Chicago at the now defunct Mega Mall in uh, displays that very much hark back to that sensibility of working with materials and displaying, the art of display. That's my bio, that's my bio in terms of cultural and, uh, influences. I started my work in graduate school trying to overcome my perceived weaknesses in the areas of drawing and painting by leaning on objects which are very familiar to me and representing through them, getting them to talk more vividly about uh, new found ideas than I could. My sources seemed limitless. They could come from work. I stole many a box of staples from various offices. The Home Depot, of course, throwaways um, of all kinds, yarn, hair implements, staples. This is a piece using the uh, Fibonacci sequences. My goal was to make minimal interventions to found in everyday objects. A special area of focus has been hair, my own, and my pets, and uh, I do feel like hair of all matter has a special kind of agency, formidable agency, and how else could we explain the hair industry, which um, according to some figures on the internet, um, raked in $39.5 billion this year. It's probably just in the United States and not including hair products, that's just hair salons. That's my cat's hair. Yeah. Um, think power, think power. Returning to Bennett, think power is the curious ability of inanimate things to animate, to act, to produce effects dramatic and subtle. The processes that recur in my work are deconstruction, that's a couple of baseballs, um, a kind of 3D collage, accumulations and accretions, a tea house made of the tissue of 2,000 bags. And more recently, I'm thinking of my work as assemblages in the in the context of um, new materialisms, collaborations with matter. This um, piece here brings together the toughness of AstroTurf, the coziness of a, an Afghan found in a thrift store, the grammar of domesticity as expressed by welcoming mats and the comfort of fluff pillows. As of late, I've returned to a kind of 
uh, intense handwork to, um, in an attempt to fuse these complex materialities, this piece is made of fused commercial plastic bags and it's crocheted. The column is, uh, appears to be um, solid and, and parts of it are, but it's really aided by gravity. And this is some fairly recent work, um, towers that honor my grandmothers and my, and my great-grandmothers and my grandmother, and also Simon Rod Rodia, who built the Watts Tower single-handedly in LA. Um, I feel great responsibility to come up with ways to use the things that I collect and that abound in the environment. And I'm thinking of my practice most recently as a meditation and a collaboration with materials to discover new forms and processes, not so much to liberate matter, but liberate myself from uh, narrow use value conceptions that we project through our society of, of consumption. But it is a challenge. And so I close with a announcement, invitation to my 50th um, birthday, which happened a while ago. And um, in the words of uh, Matt Stone, who designed this, I hope this doesn't go on my tombstone, but this was on the invitation on the rum wake and rummage sale. She died the way she lived, surrounded by the clutter that mattered most to her. Thank you. You're on. Okay. Now, how do I? I just go play. Yeah. Sweet. All right. Um, so, I am obsessed with light in as much as I am obsessed with things that you can't touch. You see them, they're definitely there, there's not a question about it, but you can't touch them. And that is an essential paradox that has never been okay with me, it's not okay right now, it's never gonna be okay. And what I try and do is then, okay, well how can I, how can I touch it? How can I make it material? And what does it mean that I even want that? I do, that's what I want, so why do I want that? So this is what my work is an exploration of, and is also an exploration of time. Um, so I think about light as an index of times. Light can show you time, um, especially if you're metho methodical about it, which I'm obsessively methodical in how I go about things. I like to imagine, if only to myself, that there's a scientific rigor to what I do, that it is real information. I am offering you real information. I would be incredibly offended if anyone ever accused me of using my imagination. <laughs> I'm going way back in time right now to shadow tracing from 1998. In order to show you one of the very first iterations, I was an academic figurative painter drawer person and this was my very first piece ever painting shadows. It's on an exterior wall that was rather derelict, and I noticed every day on my shuttle ride past this wall that these trees would throw these shadows on the wall. And I decided, oh, that would be funny. I legit thought, funny, that would be funny to paint them. Um, so I painted the tree's shadows, and I didn't really think about how the street light across the street that cast their shadows on the wall, and the shadow that I traced out was a early springtime shadow. The tree hadn't come into its leaves yet. Um, and when it did, it created a visual record of the tree's growth. I wasn't thinking about fixing the shadow in place as a way to create a record of the tree's growth, but that's what kind of alerted to me that light can show time. And it was perfect because this was the Center for Personal Development. It's no longer there, but the Center for Personal Development was a not-for-profit helping adults with disabilities to lead more independent lives. So a lot of my work is driven by questions that I have about light. Again, facts, 
facts. I want to know what would it look like if you could see all of the daylight that comes into a place at once. Uh, so for my MFA show at the School of the Art Institute, I crazily ran around with a piece of chalk documenting how the sunlight came into the space. It was a west-facing space. From 1.30 in the afternoon to 5.30 at night when the sun set behind a building across the street. The sun wasn't gone, it was just setting behind a building across the street. And if I could overlap all that information on top of each other, I would see a whole day's worth of light at one time, and that's what I wanted. This is my friend Shira standing in the space. I was next asked as a, as from, the, from the MFA show. I was asked to um, come and do a piece for a beautiful space. And I said, yes, of course, I'm interested in doing a piece in your beautiful space. Go to the beautiful space, there's no sunlight in it. So I built a scale model of the space, and I cut out where the windows had been cinder blocked out. And I put it in the same orientation as the space to figure out the question. What would it look like if light could come in here? I also put tungsten, um, they had these hot tungsten lights, and I put uh, daylight gels over them. So that's what the space looked like. And those are those hot tungsten lights that they had in there. And that's what it looked like once I figured out how the sunlight would look if it could come in through the cinder blocked out windows and also through this loading dock area that you see over here to the left. That's a detail. What happens to a space when everybody leaves and you shut off all the lights? What light do you see? From 2005, this is an attempt to answer that question. I was surprised, I was surprised. I sit in front of the spaces with a whole fan deck worth of color and I hold the chips up to the wall and that's how I pick my color. I was surprised that a white wall turns purple. What? Why does a white wall turn purple? So that is the answer to the question of when you turn off all the lights in the gallery, what does it look like? Um, what light comes in? A billboard across the street made a greenish light. The building across the street threw some light onto the floor of the space, and you got all these light incidents. Can a depiction of light stop time? My friends, Samakshi and Gisela, were leaving, Samakshi was um, moving back to New Delhi, and Gisela was moving back to the East Coast, and I was not okay with it. And so in a similar way as I'm not okay with the fact that you can't touch light, I also decided to paint light onto my friends and onto the space that around them and make them stay still in order to enact the possibility of freezing time. They were supposed to stay still for the whole opening, they failed miserably, the one simple task and they moved. So I guess the answer to this question is no. This is a more, I, as I do these things, I refine my technique. I think the first thing looked a little bit clumsy and not that trompe l'oeil. This one is much more trompe l'oeil. Um, I also was able to kind of uh, hone my color relationships a little bit better. So this is another day. This is a full August day worth of sunlight. This is moonlight. This is a day's worth of sunlight and uh, reflected light. The sun would bounce off the buildings across the street. And I, this was interesting because what the curators were interested in seeing was my process over time. So I would go back every couple of weeks and add another light event that I saw happen in the space. So this is, these shots are taken at the end of the show, like the last couple weeks when I had done my last intervention, and it kind of captured all the light that I saw coming in here. This is one day, but 24 hours, so nighttime too, in half hour intervals. This one takes a little bit more explaining. It is a public art project on the bus shelters downtown along Washington Street, and what I did is that every vertical column represents a half an hour, so this particular one goes from 5, 5.30, 6, 6.30, 7, 7.30. And so we see the transition from daytime to nighttime. I was literally just taking photographs of the scene in front of me as the light changed every half hour. And I ended up putting this grid up. And if you stand in the exact correct vantage point for each windscreen, you see simultaneously the scene 
that you would just see if there was nothing on the glass, and my stickers, right, on there. This is adhesive vinyl. So if you stand in the right vantage point, my stickers line up with the scene and show you that scene at different times of day all at once. That's one of the bus shelters in its totality from midnight to midnight. The same thing is true of the back. That was a whole another photography project. Different lens, but same idea. If you're standing on the sidewalk looking at these windscreens, you would see the exact scene. It would line up with your eyeballs, uh, but it would be different times of day. So I'm asking the question, what does light mean? What means light? Is there a means test for light? And the reason I'm asking it is because I was asked to do this piece for a private club. The Arts Club of Chicago commissioned me to do this piece in their um, garden setting. And their garden is visible from the outside, but it is not accessible. It's fenced off. So who gets to see this? How do you get to see it? I copied the fence. The fence has a kind of diamond configuration. I copied the orientation of the fence's wrought iron bars to make these towers. And each tower has four faces. On one face, I did trompe l'oeil, light, and shadow, looking at how the light comes onto the, the brick wall of the arts club. I'm thinking about barriers, the fence as a barrier, the wall as a barrier, and I'm thinking about how the light and shadow play across this wall over the course of a day. Though I'm copying the light, how it happens at the spring equinox. Uh, this light is specific to the spring equinox. On this face, I'm answering the question, if this wall wasn't here, what you don't see in these pictures is that to the right of this fence, there is a brick wall. If this wall isn't here, what do you see? And you, do, you see part of the private club area, which is this little cafe that they have out on that terrace. So I documented the cafe, and I put it onto these illuminated towers so that when you walk by, you see that cafe. I'm kind of giving you visual access in place of literal access. On the other side, if you stand on Ontario Street looking at it, you see the, the library that you never see. The Arts Club has a public gallery venue, but it also has private areas, including a private bar area that has a phenomenal collection of artist monographs and also um, other art texts and uh, theory books, um, group shows, different things like that. And so I documented the library at one-to-one -one scale, and I put it on the towers on the back. And that is uh, my work and my relationship to material. Hello. Um, so I, I'm going to show some works, and I think I'm going to talk more about some overarching concerns that I have uh, throughout the works, rather than sort of go work by work and give you the whole spiel of each one. <laughs> um, so let's begin. Um, so this was a work from undergrad. Uh, I think my last work from undergrad. Um, just to give some clarification of what you're looking at, it's a, a doorway uh, made out of these sort of crown moldings uh, that I originally like uh, fabricated with wood, and then I I molded the whole thing and casted it in beeswax, so that whole thing is beeswax with like a steel reinforced um, base. Um, these are some drawings. They were made uh, via sort of tracing parts of different photographs and then trace, tracing different photographs in the same drawing, so a kind of collaging, tracing uh, exercise together. Um, and I'm showing these two works uh, to sort of show like the initial concerns that I used to have um, that have led to my current concerns. Um, I used to be interested in like architecture uh, and phenomenology and specifically in this sort of slippage that happens between experiencing uh, spaces uh, and, and experiencing uh, memories of spaces. 
And this idea of slippage between uh, sort of sensory experience and uh, memory experience as far as like superimposing and projecting uh, both simultaneously. Um, so this is more recent work uh, and I sort of transitioned from these concerns that I used to have about space that were much more um, closely focused with ideas of architecture and ideas of entropy and ruins, but specifically through like very sort of architectural vernacular, like walls, doors, doorways, windows. Um, and I sort of started to think about what are the things inside those spaces that are interesting that I can also think about this kind of relationship of slippage between perception and experience with objects and things. Um, and so a step in that direction was starting to think about miniatures in a way. Um, and so, so what you're seeing here is a sort of an assemblage of different things. Uh, there are found plants. There is this miniature cast house that I uh, made all messed up. <laughs> um, there are uh, some rocks. There are miniature palm trees. And then there are these dowels that some of which are painted and then some of which have images that are transferred onto each side. Um, that is the same continuous image transferred all around. Um, and what I was thinking with uh, these, I was thinking about this idea of images in relation to objects and in relation to surfaces. And the images on these dowels to me are this sort of metaphor for thinking of a portal that is also a part of a structure of something. Um, and to me, that was sort of an interesting, again, kind of slippage between categories and a way of thinking of uh, lived spaces as well. Um, so this was sort of another step in the direction of thinking about uh, how objects can relate to each other and how categories between objects can have this quality where um, I sort of like to think of them as a Venn diagram with multiple layers or multiple stack layers where you can look at an object and sort of think of um, its formal qualities, its aesthetic qualities, your personal relationship to it, uh, how a social relationship to it might look, what your uh, unique idiosyncratic relationship to that thing is versus how you perceive others might know the thing. If, for example, let's say it's a tool and you're uh, familiar with that tool, how you think of that tool's function, how you think of um, that tool in relation to other things. And so I like to think of how one object has all of these possibilities of categorization and when in proximity with another and when misused perhaps, those uh, qualities sort of change and begin to, to create new meanings or, or surge new meanings between each other. Um, and again, I, I was also starting to think or continuing to think of images uh, as these sort of portals in a way and in this sense more in like a staging setting, like a miniature staging setting. Here's another of the same kind. Um, so then I started to lean a little more into how I was thinking about images and then started to think about time in relation to images. Um, so I kind of became interested in moving image work. Um, and I remember I read something about, um, what's his name? Um, he did Spirited Away, anybody? Miyazaki, Miyazaki thank you. Um, <laughs> so actually, in specifically in Spirited Away, he talks about, uh, with, in this interview with Roger Herbert, um, he had asked him something about these moments in the film where the characters sort of do nothing, that time just passes and that as far as like all the movies being animated, like you just sort of see these shots where there's just like beautiful landscapes and like there's animation in inanimate objects that are happening. Uh, and so he sort of described these as these sort of gratuitous motions uh, that he was using as a narrative device to break the flow of tension buildup in his narratives. Um, but I was kind of interested in this idea that as far as the photographs and video that you're sort of looking at right now, um, 
that these images were uh, the kinds of images that are something that we all kind of do. Like we all, anybody who has a phone will usually at some point take a photograph. And one of the kinds of photographs that people often tend to take is of something idyllic, something serene, um, sometimes even videos of flowing grass, uh, water moving. And I was interested in this sort of impulse in myself uh, as far as our relationship to these images in our phones and in relation to like social media and how we share and think about and communicate with these images because these images don't seem to have a very high sort of uh, uh, value in a sense, as far as like when thinking of images and content. Uh, and these images are, to me, a kind of respite in sort of like my personal life. Um, and there is this impulse that I have to document them and that I find sometimes in other people's social media accounts and whatnot that they also share these things, but that it's never anything that people have a conversation about or ever uh, spend any time really thinking about. So I was basically, to, sur to summarize, like thinking about how this is sort of an interesting activity and what kind of tensions would arise as far as materially speaking, combining these kinds of videos with these kinds of images uh, together. Um, so I made these series that I call scintillations and they're each uh, images that are like collage transfer, acrylic transfers, and that have a, a video embedded in them. And that actually, here's a little uh, sample. I don't know how to get back to the PowerPoint. <laughs> uh, Georgina? Oh, okay. Uh, sorry, technical difficulties. <laughs> cool, thank you. Um, yeah, so that was, uh, so again, talking about these overarching concerns and how they sort of are developing um, and how I'm responding and learning from them. Uh, here was another work that I did. Oh, that is not my audio. Ignore the audio if you hear any. So that was a work that, here, let me get rid of this audio. Hold on. Where is that coming from? Oops. I'm just going to mute it. Perfect. OK. Um, so this is a work that um, the image on the left is a, oh, shoot. Do you see it now? OK. We're going to keep it like that. Uh, so the image on the left is, um, a gallery called Clutch Gallery. Um, it is not an object that I made. It is uh, an existing miniature gallery space uh, run by Meg du Duguid. Um, and I was privileged enough to uh, be asked to do an installation for the space uh, for like the period of two weeks. Uh, it took me one week to make it, and uh, it existed for approximately two days, three days. Um, and so the installation is the image on the right, which is a miniature scene that I uh, painted with airbrush on the four sides of the walls. Um, I laser cut this little fence 
And then all these photographs that I had taken, I sort of ripped apart and I put them in these AstroTurf uh, with uh, a little street lamppost that actually, you can't tell in this photograph, but it has a little functioning light that if you close the lid, you can tell it's working. Um, so again, thinking of images as portals in a way, and as portals that are doing something in space and uh, physically in, 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 a, in a sculpture. Um, so recently, uh, or actually I started this uh, during COVID, but I'm sort of getting ahead of myself actually. Um, so I've been making more of these Im uh, dowels with images wrapped around, um, but rather than transferring them, I'm sort of pasting them with the intention of sort of playing with them as far as assemblages or like assemblage uh, exercises, um, similar to what I was doing with uh, this work. Oh, there we go. Um, and simultaneously, this was an activity that I did actually uh, while here at CAD a lot. Um, this was actually the bulk of my time spent here making lots and lots of these uh, little grape stems and plants that I, the grape stems I sort of traced. Uh, I did this sort of activity of tracing points um, arbitrarily with no particular set goal in mind. Um, and then these plants, I sort of took a step in the direction of trying to create or make something out of a non-existing volume. It still felt like an activity of tracing in a sense, but it was a little more free and, again, a little less uh, uh, planned. Um, and so many iterations were made of this. And this is sort of where I'm at right now. Um, this is sort of in progress stuff. Um, I'm printing larger scale images and wrapping them around. And I have this intention of their existence being, uh, in the end they'll be sculptural, but prior to that, the main uh, sort of reason I'm making them right now is to think about them as objects to play with as sort of intervention objects in uh, in outdoor spaces that I want to create sort of these still lives that are also involving found objects but are also using these objects as sort of interventions uh, in what's gonna be the final photographic image. Um, and this is sort of like a digital attempt of that rather than thinking of using the, the materially I sort of started playing uh, digitally with these images uh, on Photoshop. And that's it. Well, thank you, thank you to the four of you for those incredible presentations. Now, I would like to open up like a, a short dialogue. Yeah. Would you guys like to do just a quick presentation of images? Oh, sure. Oh, and also, we have a last presentation of images.
I won't repeat that. I'm showing five images, six, um, and I'll be fast, because I already took five minutes up. Um, this is a work, this is something that I did when I um, got to Los Angeles. I decided to take the train this September. Um, I was dropping my daughter off at college, and I decided I was going to take the train and make a, an event out of it for myself. Um, right when I got to LA, I left this train station, Union Station, and I saw these flowers that fell from the tree, and I thought that I should arrange them in a line, and I did. And I took some photos. This is a bad image, but um, what's going on here is something I did recently at the Franklin, um, which is a space here in Chicago. Um, I'm in a show called Still Life, and um, I thought that it'd be interesting to, um, I came up with this idea that I would order 24 balls, playground balls, and that I would fill voids um, around the Franklin, and then I would make a map to sort of um, place where those balls were in the sort of like survey of the of the um, gallery of the entire house where the gallery is and I used grid paper and what else um, there was something else I wanted to say well the photos actually back this way um, these are some of the voids that I filled I like this idea that I just have to um, fulfill a task, that I don't need to be creative or anything, you know, like I just need to uh, do a task. Um, I also, I like making works all the time, like, like leaving little traces of myself. Um, so I do it pretty often. So this was 24 traces that I left, or 20, 24 voids that I filled around the Franklin. There was also some in the gallery, and there's one back here in the window in between the um, grate to keep people from breaking in, and the window. Um, I don't have a close-up of that, but just imagine. Oh, I hate mics. They just, I, I get confused because I hear my voice in other places. But this is, um, in 2009, I, st I started, I stopped kind of making work and I had this idea that I was gonna invite people into my house for these dinners, and it was gonna be a bunch of strangers that I brought together. Um, <clears throat> and I organized all this through Facebook. So I brought, and it was sort of like me coming out as an artist, you know, me like becoming sort of like a public, publicly known artist. Um, I had this clarity that I was gonna have these dinners and I was gonna invite people to come to um, eat at my house. And I started, uh, through the process making this mole, uh, which is a sauce uh, uh, that's known in Mexico, which is a uh, very interesting and uh, exotic uh, uh, sauce that has these d different um, ingredients like chocolate and peanut butter and p pumpkin seeds. So you can't really see this, it's a bad photo. It's not a bad photo, it's just not pro projecting well, but um, this is the list of 50 ingredients that I added to make this mole. And when I told my mom I was gonna make this, she said, it's not gonna work, it's too many ingredients. And I said, it, it needs to taste like something. Um, in the end, it's gonna taste like something. So uh, the, this is them organized in order of size of the words. This is not a recipe. It's not meant to be followed as a recipe. But I also, currently, I go into people's homes sometimes and I'll make mole out of whatever they have in their cupboards. Uh, I could do this with anybody, it's like magic. Um, and you might say, I don't have those kinds of ingredients in my house, but I'll find them, because I'm also like a scavenger in some way. Um, I like filling these like empty spaces, these in-between spaces. That's us. Um, that's not one of the images. Did I, uh, let me think, there was one more. Let me just make sure. Refresh, oh, you got it in here, good. 
Hmm. Oh, no, there's this one also. During COVID times, during the quarantine, I made one work every day. It got me through this time. It was actually exciting. Every day I would wake up, I, said, I, would, I, I would say, what am I going to make today? Um, our neighbor gave us oranges, a box of them. Um, <clears throat> they came from Chicago Public Schools because he worked there, and he gave us this box. And um, I lined them up through the sliding doors. So this one, I don't, uh, there's the date, 4-9-2020. And that's the work that I made on that day. I titled them all the date that they were made. Is the new image that I sent you on here also? It should be at the bottom. One more image. I think this one's important. It's important. I'm terrible at doing more than one thing at a time. I'll, I'll just do it this way. This is easier. Th Thank you. Here, it's right here. This is the last. Ooh, that's the wrong one. This is my website in case you want to visit some of my works. Um, there's the quarantine things. Oh my goodness, I'm making this. There it is. Here it is, titled uh, Entre, which of course looks like Enter. It's what, 12 doors? And then this is the cultural center here in Chicago, and these chairs were sourced from the uh, cultural center. It was good that they were all the same because it allowed me to sort of make this regulated work of this sort of door, uh, these doors uh, sort of in, seemingly in flux, right? Um, I called it entre because it was a play on words. I like playing with language too. Um, titling things that give, uh, that speak of the meaning of the work or speak of what's going on in the work so what's happening is that in between, you know, the word entre means in between uh, is uh, these chairs are in between the doors, but this play that it's also like, it, it looks like enter. Um, I like using objects also to, to um, create new meanings with these objects and making them fit uh, just right because like every object, um, Things could fit together in things that in ways that we don't normally think of. It's just about sort of playing that, playing with them, and testing their sort of pliability, right? So that's what happened here. Um, this this work actually started as a um, as a work that wasn't that. I'm not going to look for it, um, but it, it started as half a just half of the work inside of the gallery. And then when I got to the cultural center, I had this idea that I would make the full sort of half circle. Um, that's what I wanted to show. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for your incredible presentations. Thank you uh, for showing your works and the way you conceive your own work. Um, I propose you to make like, uh, uh, I'm gonna make just some general commentaries and maybe you ask you like a general question. Then we can have like a, a round of answers and then open up the discussion to the public. And well, I mean, I'm going back to the proposal uh, uh, that Georgina made for this uh, panel. I find like very interesting the way in which you work with matter in different ways, you know, from daily objects or from memory or light, actions, performance. But yeah, maybe my, my question is related uh, to the fact or the ways in which you uh, interact with the matter and how much uh, the, the, the matter is doing something to you or doing things to other people or or, or, or has like a life by its own, and how much do you as an artist like create that? So to, to put it in other way, for example, in the, 
in the Renaissance, there was this philosopher, Giovanni Pico della Mirandola, who wrote, uh, talking about freedom and liberty, that now the humans could create their own destiny just as a painter would create a painting or a sculptor uh, uh, and a sculpture. So, so indeed, our, our ideals of, of the modern uh, subject and of the modern person is based like in, 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 in a will that, uh, that creates something, even our own destiny. But I think what is interesting about the proposal made uh, by Georgina, and that's what I want to ask you all, is uh, are those like uh, matters that you use on your works, or do you feel they have an agency by, by themselves, or if you do action, if you work with time and space or light, or, or even with these daily objects, how much they interact with you, how much you are like the creators of what happens there, how much you are just like uh, having another kind of relationship with those objects. So yeah, maybe I will ask you uh, that just to open up a, a dialogue and then dialogue with the audience too. So yeah, I don't know if you want, uh, anyone wants to uh, begin, yeah. Ahí está. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm really interested. So I. I've been reading, in, uh, as far as like something that's been influencing my work about like affect theory, um, and I sort of got started with that reading about this author, author uh, Kathleen Stewart, uh, and in like the first few pages, uh, there's this thing that has stayed with me that she, where she describes affects as. Uh, this surging of a continual motion of relations. And it's a much longer sentence than that, but that's like the part of the sentence that really like, like sort of spins around in my head a lot. Um, and I, as far as like the sort of content in my work that I have, like, like the individual elements that I have affinity towards uh, and a sort of developing intuition towards working with, um, they kind of all sort of come together via these like impressions that I have that I feel have this uh, pull to them or this like gravity to them. Um, and so then I'm really curious mostly about finding ways to like either communicate that or reveal something about that instance. Um, for example, like I might be walking a street or something and maybe I find that there is like a weird uh, set of objects that are laying in a particular corner of a street in a way that seems sort of strange um, and that brings up questions of why are they there, were they placed there, was it thrown there, was it an accident, uh, if it's a made object who made it, if it's like a more commodity type of thing, like why does it, why did it land in that particularly precarious way. So like, I like to think of these sets of objects and their relationships to each other and the questions that surge from them uh, as like a starting point to think of things that I would work with that are based off that or that are inspired by that in some way. Um, I wanted to talk about like uh, people, you know, and the necessity for for people to activate the object for myself. Um, if the people aren't there, like I feel like it's not, it's not activated um, and it's not, um, it's just not interesting to me if there's nobody there to sort of engage with the, with the object. Um, so for instance, in the image with, uh, the, where, when I got to LA, like for me, it was really about like how sort of people responded to the flowers that I laid on the ground, or um, you know like the balls that I put the vo where I put the voids, uh, or where I fill the voids at the Franklin Gallery. Um, I I was most satisfied in that work when kids came and they took the because I I also had blank um, sheets of the grid paper with the with the, with the um, survey on it. I was most satisfied with the work when the kids were actually, the kids that came to the gallery were actually 
using it and finding those things, and they were very joyous and excited. Um, I think that when I was a painter, um, and when I'd be washing my brushes at two o'clock in the morning, um, there was, of course, there was a sadness that came in. The sadness that I was gonna do this for my, the rest of my life, and that uh, it wasn't really a uh, practice that involved other people. So um, I think that that sadness is what caused me to leave that, that world behind and start these dinners that I told you about, um, where I invited people into my house, and that became my practice. And then finally, with the mole, um, I think of that as a resourcefulness, you know, bringing together these disparate objects, these things that don't belong to create new logic. Um, and I don't really like metaphors a lot, but I always thought of that work as a metaphor for bringing together things or people that don't belong. Um, so for me, it's really much the importance of people to activate those objects, and if there's no people, there's no activation. And no connection. So I, um, in order to figure out a little bit more about my relationship to light and to paint, um, I started researching into what physics has to say about light. And the interesting thing for me about my chosen subject was that physics also kind of has this uh, foundational frustration with light, light, how it can predictably behave sometimes as a wave and predictably at other times behave like a particle, depending on the experimental context. Um, and that tracks, that tracks because my own frustration is kind of uh, manifest and extended in the direction of physics. Um, my introduction to the kinds of ideas that we are talking about here, and I brought the book with me because I was refreshing my mind about what Karen Barad had to say is Karen Barad's book, Meeting the Universe Halfway. And in it, she uh, coins this idea about agential realism that things don't exist as discrete objects that can be taxonomized, as what Georgina was saying, but rather that things um, are co-constitutive, that things make one another through interaction. Um, and to me, that was like really fascinating because, yeah, uh, another human has to complete the circuit, in my particular case, of a kind of uncanniness, of a kind of this isn't what I thought, so what am I engaging? Um, so that's, that's, I think that's as much as I'll say about it for now. Yeah, I think we're coming full circle to, um, well, something that I think is, is very, that we, we kind of refuse at the level of humans. You know, you bring it up, Alberto, in talking about um, the kind of deadness or sadness that there is when there are no, there's no sort of community or relational aspect. But I think that what new materialisms are asking, asking us to think about is how we extend that relations of humans or how we, we, we become actants to use a term that's, uh, that's from uh, assemblage theory and um, Bruno Latour, uh, French, uh, I think, uh, political philosopher, um, and the idea that, that then we, it, rather than actors, we're actants, and so how can we see ourselves as part of these assemblages that include other living things, animals, matter, and not in this atomized way that is uh, really a construct of our minds, but rather in complex, you know, systems, which is the really the path that we need to be thinking about if we are going to tackle these phenomenal problems that we have created, thinking that we can control everything. So when I see one of your performances, I see you collaborating with that ball, and then uh, the walls that are in the space and the people here and the drink that gets in the path. So they all become part of this event that would be impossible in isolated, like, or, th or thinking about it in isolated parts. Um, I think in my own work I'm grappling with 
m my own attraction to matter, which makes me a kind of borderline hoarder, and it's a, an area that I'm fascinated with, and, um, and via, via Jane Bennett, who also um, has a fa fascinating talk on, uh, online about the, the force of the hoard or something like that. Um, it's, you know, I see myself as part of like this larger system of humankind that has generated so much uh, material infrastructure and things that we can't even, you know, like when you're talking about portals to, portals to nature, portals to these moments of uh, uh, quiet, right? Um, it's harder to find those. And then it, I was really struck what, by what you said, that, that those moments, you know, that we all have the impulse to record those things, like the, the blades of the grass, swinging, uh, swaying in, in the breeze, and yet those aren't momentous, you know, those don't uh, necessarily generate a lot of commentary, but I think it's part of like being grounded in a, in a materiality that is um, larger than ourselves. So, yeah, I don't think I'm gonna answer the question, I'm just, I'm just gonna share one last anecdote from our life, outing ourselves as uh, people with moth problems. Um, so I just recently discovered that moths have been invisibly working on our on all our clothes for like the duration of the pandemic, and we had to like empty all the drawers and vacuum. And you know now I'm like obsessed thinking about larva and tiny eggs that I can't see. But um, this coincided. I mean, it's my orientation thinking about these ideas coincides with something we heard on on uh, public radio the other day about medical maggots. Have people heard about that? These are like maggots that they're using um, in severe cases like burn victims and people with uh, diabetes that have, you know, um, necrosis. But these maggots come in, and I mean, maggots are really um, kind of repulsive to think about, but they are like wonderful at cleaning up some of these wounds in exceptional ways. So it's just an example of the collaboration that we as bodies, you know, can have with other things and beings um, if we pursue a kind of different line of thought. And that was, that's, that was the attempt with this talk, and I think we kind of touched the tip of the iceberg. Um, but, yeah, I don't know if you want to open it to, you, you want to? Yeah, no, well, I, Alberto. What, what, you, what was the one thing? You, you want to tell us one thing. You, wanna, you just wanted to tell us this one thing. I have to know. I'm not going to be able to sleep. Well, I, I didn't tell you the thing because I didn't reach my goal. But um, I wrote the thing. So the thing is the thing. Um, and uh, I, I wrote it. If I would have if I would have achieved it in uh, volleys, I would I wouldn't have wrote it. I would have just left it at that, and I maybe would have ended the performance early. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I think like what what, it, what I found very interesting about uh, Georgina's cold and and about this like provocation of thinking on agency and matter. It's like also, yeah, like trying to understand that we are like part of bigger environments in which there are another living uh, beings and another objects which are uh, in a very direct relationship with us. And there is urgent today, I think, to, to realize that if we keep like only thinking like in the human being and the way we are doing it now, it's gonna be quite uh, destructive and quite dangerous as we have seen like in this recent pandemic related to the world in which we live and in the kind of uh, system of production we live and etc. But well, we, we've been here for a while, so also uh, if, if, if you, someone has uh, a question there, if you have like a particular question for the artist that presented uh, their work or something related to agency, to sculpture, uh, whatever you want to share. Uh, 
um, something you want to ask, or I don't know if also you want to share something about uh, what one of you said to you. Um, I have a, a thought to share. Um, <laughs> as far as like uh, sort of being approached for this conversation and, and like the topic of um, agency of matter, vibrant matter, um, I forget the other term that uh, was in the Jane Bennett uh, thing power. Um, I find it sort of, I find it interesting to like, to sort of read, like I have her book and I've sort of glanced through it only, but, um, but I find it interesting to think of these terms as a way of looking at uh, perhaps like in my case, like my practice through like a sort of zooming out kind of lens. Like, like if I were to zoom out from just my own subjectivity to think of like myself in like an omniscient third person, uh, I'm part of, you know, like, uh, a larger world uh, that's constituted of many other uh, subjects, actants, and whatnot. Um, it's maybe a way to, for me to think about how to like reflect on how like um, like I work with my own intuition, how like the things that I'm compelled by um, sort of say something about me in a way, and like how maybe my personal life and my practice are in some ways intertwined that are not ways I would have realized without that sort of zooming out. But I find it sort of hard to imagine beyond this idea of zooming out how my practice in a way could be affected that I could speak in such a way where like I am speaking about these really large issues um, that affects so many people in so many different ways and in ways that I'll maybe never even know um, as far as like interpersonally. Um, and I don't know, I find it hard to imagine like that affecting the kind of thing I do in such a way where I can make something that will change uh, or address these large issues and change that change the situation for the better. I can only really imagine myself making the kinds of things I do such that they, in maybe a small way, evoke like a modeling of behavior or of thought um, that might help someone uh, in a sort of individual case. And that from that, that's, there's like a, a building of that um, to something that I can't quite predict. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> So that, you know, this, this is more like, it's not even just theoretical because I think we're moving towards that, a transdisciplinarity where, you know, um, the tour talks about these assemblages and how like components, and Deleuze talk, talks about that too, components can be um, taken out of the assemblage and plugged into another assemblage so that rather than thinking of interior relationships, we're thinking of these exterior or parts that can be recombined with other parts. And so it's really about you think about your practice with materials and with ideas and with others, but then also thinking about artists as part of assemblages that are addressing these issues. So, so right there, you're kind of betraying a kind of bias that's very human-centric. What can I do to, to, to solve these, these problems? And it's really about kind of you know, diminishing our egos and saying, well, how can I be part of an assemblage with bees and agricult agriculture and scientists and other artists and um, you know, women that know how to ferment food or women and other people, you know? So do you, do you get my, my drift? It's really about us almost like taking ourselves out of the assemblage machine of art and the art market and all that, you know, and plugging and inserting ourselves in other assemblages. Um, I think that's what I find really 
fascinating and exciting. And I don't have a recipe for how, but I think it, it begins with our minds. It begins with a kind of shift of paradigm, and that's exactly what these uh, new materialisms are ushering in. So let's go make assemblages. <laughs> Great. I mean, yeah. Yo concuerdo. And, and yeah, I think those are good words like to maybe beginning, begin to close the, uh, this panel and also like talk a little bit more with some mezcales that we have. So yeah, I want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, thank you, Georgina, for organizing all this program. Thank you, uh, Carlos and the Chicago Art Department for partnering on this program and uh, our incredible DJ and sound tech. Thanks so much. Uh, we can now join uh, and enjoy beverage courtesy of our sponsors, Del Maguey Single Village Mezcal, Topo Chico, and Revolution Brewing. And I, uh, we need to thank you also to the National Endowment for the Arts, Illinois Humanities, Artworks Fund, Bocalo, and our many generous partners, uh, grand makers, and donors like you who make this festival possible. Thank you. Please visit our website, uh, leadloose.org, for more information about upcoming programs and to purchase tickets to our signature event, which is going to be tomorrow, the live show magazine, November 4th, at the Logan Center uh, for the Arts. Thank you so much, and, and thank you for <laughs> <laughs>